Hello. Welcome to day three of Keynotes. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, as I always say. <laughs> um, I'm personally very impressed with the quality of content and speakers. So really thank you to the community for making this fantastic event happen. Uh, we're getting some very good feedback on uh, social media and, you know, good to go. So uh, today I'll, you know, introduce speakers as they come along, but we have some very cool innovation leaders uh, speaking and you absolutely want to hear what they have to say. Uh, let me start off by saying uh, and introducing our first speaker today, uh, Farah uh, Papuyuano. Uh, she is a leader. She's a co-founder and president of Edgeworks. And without any further ado, uh, please welcome Farah. Hi, Arpit. Thank you for the introduction. Incredibly happy to be here today uh, to talk about edge computing. So I'll get to my first slide here. And um, today I'm going to talk about the rise of edge computing and really accelerating real world applications. We all care about edge computing, which is why we're at the conference today. But really what we've been asking ourselves and the market's been asking us, our investors have been asking us, when is the rubber really going to meet the road? When are we actually going to see these real world applications starting to come out? So a little bit about myself. Um, who's far P and why am I listening to her at nine o'clock on a Wednesday morning? Um, as Arpit mentioned, uh, I am the co-founder of an edge computing company called Edgeworks. And uh, I've been building the edge um, through the start startup since 2017. So I've been doing this for a little bit of time now. Uh, we are the creators of the Eclipse IOFI project. Uh, it's an edge project that's open source under the Eclipse Foundation. I also sit on the board of directors of the Eclipse Foundation and have for a couple of years. Um, and uh, prior to that, I was an investor uh, before, uh, uh, after my years as an operator and spent the last 10 years uh, looking at the te next technologies to invest in. So obviously spent time investing in cloud computing, big data, storage. Um, and that journey, AI, that journey led me to edge computing because it seemed natural to me that, um, you know, all of that data that's being generated outside of the cloud and data center wasn't going to be shuttled back to the to the cloud for processing. And so we were going to need a new way of doing this. Um, <clears throat> so the question I get asked most often and, you know, anyone in the edge industry could probably attest to this is what is the edge? You know, but the real question we should be asking ourselves is where is the edge? And I'm going to take a contrarian position on this. You know, I'm sure we've heard about, hey, this is the mobile edge, this is the telco edge, this is the, you know, enterprise edge, this is the IoT edge. I'm not even sure I got those labels correct, but I know um, there are these distinct edges. And I'm here to say that I don't think that that's the way we should be approaching the edge. In my view, the edge is anything that sits outside of a cloud and as a part of a cloud edge continuum. And the reason for this is if we think about edges in these siloed ways, the mobile edge, the IoT edge, the enterprise edge, then we're going to be starting to build stacks that way. Our architectures are going to be designed for those pieces of hardware. Our software stacks are going to be designed and we're going to start to be building these silos. When in effect, um, most companies who have complex infrastructure have things running on a variety of different things. They don't just have things running on a telco edge and the cloud. They just don't have things running on an IoT edge and in the cloud. And I have customers that uh, we work with that you know, uh, like I'll take a car company as an example. They're running things on their cars. Okay, that would be maybe considered the sort of endpoints. They have things running on roadside units. They have things they want to run on the light structures. They have things that are running in micro data centers. They're aggregating them at colos. Uh, they're working with the cell, cell towers or, uh, and carriers to run things on, on the cell edge. And then they're putting all that data back in the cloud. For them, the edge is incredibly fluid. And it may be today that they may want to run things at the cell tower because uh, for a certain reason, and then they may want to orchestrate that closer to uh, the endpoints because of latency or whatnot. If we build these edges in differently, then that's going to be incredibly dif difficult to do. If we can make the edges look seamless, then they can move these things around uh, with no problem at all. And so that, that is the 
the view that I see from the edge. So how do we take these two things that are incredibly different and make them look seamless, right? When you think about the cloud, we think about deploying a one 5,000 node cluster in a very hom homogenous environment with the expectation of HA networking versus at the edge where we'll see 5,000 one node clusters in an incredibly heterogeneous environment where networking is incredibly varied. Uh, you have different network topologies that you have to deal with. And the expectation is that edge nodes will disappear from time to time and minutes, hours, even days. And that's not considered out of the ordinary. So that leads us to the rise of what I like to think of as edge native computing. So it's a, at this point, I'm going to ask you guys to us. Speak nerd and point. Uh, um, what this is basically saying is that edge native should extend cloud native. And what I mean by that is, you know, we all know what cloud native is for sitting at this conference anyway. Um, and, and it's incredibly important to, you know, how we build cloud computing. Cloud native really focuses on the qu central question of how we deliver applications, uh, the delivery of elastic scalability on. on because I know you guys know what that is, um, and, you know, the development methodologies. What Edge Native does is really embrace those principles, but extend that um, to the edge. And what I mean by that is like on the surface, if you use Cloud Native principles um, at the edge, you can make the surface look exactly the same for uh, the developers, but the complexities of the edge, the disparate hardware, the network challenges, the location, you can abstract that away and really focus on how do I bring those primitives forward in a way that allows me to take advantage of the goodness that they provide without worrying about the complexity. So the development methodology and the tooling that we use is still very much the same. And it may help for me to contextualize this uh, with an example. And I'm going to use Kubernetes because, of course, we're sitting here. Um, uh, as a part of the CNCF, and I know everyone here knows what Kubernetes is, um, whether you're technical or not, <clears throat> you've at least heard of it. And so I actually did a Google search and found this diagram uh, from a, a, an edge computing company, and I'm not, it's not here to pick on them, which is why I didn't put their name here. Um, but this is pretty common here where um, they're trying to take Kubernetes and bring it down to the edge, and anyone who's uh, spent any time in the edge industry knows that all of the companies are rushing to think about how do we take Kubernetes to the edge. And, Ultimately, Kubernetes was built for the cloud. Kubernetes was built really well for a one 5,000 node cluster where um, we really don't care where things are running and we expect high levels of uh, network connectivity. And so, you know, basically what this company's done is taken the, uh, those principles and really brought it down to the edge and said, okay, well, I'm going to basically build a mini cloud. Um, I'm going to take an edge, which uh, is typically thought of as maybe 5,000 one, 5, one node clusters, create a three node environment, provide HA, which is not uh, really considered um, really uh, common in edge environments and, and try to use Kubernetes to orchestrate. The thought is right, but the execution um, is not really taking advantage of edge native principles. If you think about it from an edge native standpoint, what you would like to be able to do is still leverage Kubernetes, but you would like to orchestrate it in a different way. And at the edge, I care about um, what type of hardware I'm running. So perhaps if I'm taking a AI microservice, I may want to care about, well, does the hardware have, you know, an AI accelerator like a GPU? Um, so maybe or Kubernetes wants to go and look for that. Uh, I care about latency. I mean, perhaps need it within a certain level of microseconds from a certain endpoint. So maybe I can sit, tell Kubernetes to orchestrate for that. Um, I care about um, location. Perhaps I need to run it on a certain factory floor uh, for security concerns or for GDPR requirements. So what we want to do is uh, obviously allow Kubernetes to think about these attributes and take Kubernetes and create um, an edgeware scheduler such that it, we can extend Kubernetes down to the edge. So cloud developers don't have to learn an entirely new paradigm for development, uh, but they can take advantage of what is useful at the edge.
So why is everyone rushing to take Kubernetes to the edge? Is it just a fad? Is it just a thing to do? Or is there a real rhyme or reason behind it? And the reason is this. Um, we've spent the last 15 plus years investing in the cloud. You know, the, this entire foundation, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, is entirely built around the cloud. Um, and we've got a lot of tooling there. We've got a lot of uh, developers there. Um, everything has really been focused there. But the data is now coming out from the edge. Uh, and the data growth there is going to be exponential. And most of the data growth over the next 30 years is going to be coming from there. So how do we bridge that gap? In order to do so, we really must unlock the power of cloud developers. Edge developers don't actually exist today. I mean, the only edge developers are the ones who've been working on these projects for some time now, and we now consider ourselves to be edge developers. But cloud developers, there are so many of them, and we need to leverage them to build and deploy edge applications, which is why we want edge native to be a corollary to uh, cloud native so that they can leverage existing tooling, existing principles, existing methodologies. So why is there so much confusion in the market today and why are, haven't developers gotten it yet? And so um, I can say this as a member, a sitting board member of an open source foundation and a uh, major contributor to, contributor to an open source project that we are being incredibly stupid about this, our, ourselves included. And we're adding to the confusion. I still believe that the future is gonna be built through open source. We've seen this proved out in the cloud. We've seen this proved out in the internet. We've seen this pro proved out in big data. This will also be done um, with edge computing as well. And how are we contributing to this confusion? By asking ourselves, which is best? Uh, you know, and I get this question all the time. I really like IOFOG, but I need to go out and see which one is best. I really like Edge Foundry, but I really need to go out and see which is best. I can't be a part of the uh, Eclipse Edge Native project because um, our companies decided to take a bet on LF Edge. I can't be a part of LF Edge because my companies decided to take a bet on the Eclipse Edge Native. And um, you know, all of these projects sit across all of these different foundations and they all operate and solve different things. Some fo focus on the far edges and, and they all sit as a part of the continuum all the way up to the cloud. Some focus on uh, de development and deployment, and some focus all the way up to operations, and they're sitting at different things, solving different problems. The question out that is being asked, which is best, is uh, akin to asking, well, which is better, Kubernetes or Terraform? Which is better, Kafka or Hadoop? Now we know, now we know enough about big data to know that's a silly question, right? Um, and often we're going to use both Kafka and Hadoop because they solve different things. They none of, neither one can do all of solve everything. And which is the same in all of these projects. Neither one can solve all of these projects. Neither foundation is going to solve all these projects. But what we've been doing up until now is focusing on in on it. It's like, okay, you know, how do I position IOFOG and how do I promote IOFOG? And I'm going to pick on IOFOG because that's the project that, you know, um, uh, we've contributed to. How do I push that one in and, and say that this one is the best? And that's really not what we need to be doing. What we need to be doing is showing the developers how to build easy to use interoperable building grids. Cloud developers today now know if they need to build an application, if they need, you know, what pieces of open source software to use. Okay, I need Hadoop, I need Kafka, I need uh, Kubernetes Orchestrate, I, you know, I need Terraform to, you know, uh, uh, automate my infrastructure. They know how to put all these things together. And we as a foundation have not made this easy for developers. If I were to ask my kids today, which Lego built brick is better, the long one or the short one, the big wheels or the small wheels, they look at me as if I'm crazy because in order to build out the things that they want to build, they're going to use all of these pieces. And that's pretty much the questions we've been kind of posing to the, to the, to the developers. And this is the things that they've been going through today. So I provided a sample cloud or a sample stack uh, from the cloud edge continuum to show kind of how, how these pieces would work together. For the cloud, obviously, um, you know, we have cloud VMs and Kubernetes is a great orchestrator for the cloud. Uh, you know, we as a company love it. Um, you know, we've actually taken IOFOG, and I'm not here to promote any one piece of technology, but we've taken IOFOG and created an Edgeware scheduler. Um, you know, I really believe that open source technologies are stronger together. So, you know, we teamed up with Scupper, which wasn't uh, originally designed for the edge, but did great with multi-cloud and building a mesh. And so we combined those together to build uh, an edge mesh. 
um, and they have become a major contributor to the project. Um, on top of that, we have Ditto and Hano, again, um, edge projects. On the edge stack, you know, we could take any hardware node and Project Eve would be a great layer to sit on top of these edge nodes and take advantage of uh, what, what the nodes have to offer. You know, we like to think about it as of them like kind of like VMware for the edge. Um, maybe they wouldn't position themselves that way, but they have some powerful tooling that we can leverage. On top of that, uh, you know, using IOFOG and again, Scupper to orchestrate the edge and, and uh, figure out where to deploy uh, these microservices. Edge Foundry has a number of powerful microservices that allow us to talk to different types of machine and tooling. IOFOG can't do that, and neither can Eve. Um, Mosquito does great work for translation. Hawkbit allows us to, um, you know, uh, uh, deploy firmware and do over-the-air upgrades. On top of that, that now allows us to, you know, in putting these pieces together, allows us to now just really focus on, okay, what are the applications that we can build? You know, AI, ML applications, IoT applications. Uh, these are things developers know how to do, right? If we can just give them the pieces for the edge stack, um, they can just go and do what they know how to do best. Sorry, work, bear with me here while I move this to the next slide here. Um, so again, I'm not here to push any one thing, but I want to kind of give an, ex an example of how this comes together in the real world. So, you know, obviously the um, COVID has really hit everybody and, you know, this pandemic came at us hard in uh, March and, and is still sitting around here today. At the time, you know, our company thought, hey, uh, you know, my kids are actually going back to school and they, they were taking temperatures with a manual thermometer. And, you know, I thought to myself, there's got to be a better way to do this for my kid who actually really hates being, having his temperature taken. And so, you know, thinking about some of the edge stacks that we've built um, for other customers, we thought, hey, we can do this um, very easily leveraging open source technology. We were able to take this from concept to, uh, you know, MVP in six weeks. If it had taken us months or years, uh, it's, we would, this opportunity would have passed us by. And if we had to build all of this software, software for from scratch or sit around and try and figure out which is best, that never would have been done. What we did was, and of course, um, you know, our team has familiarity with all of these uh, different pieces of ed software. We took these open source te technologies that um, exist today and combined these Lego bricks, bricks together to create, um, uh, this, this solution in, like I said, six weeks. Do I have a team of edge developers? Nope. They're all cloud developers. Um, and, you know, within six weeks, they're able to create this and say, okay, well, I, these AI models to de detect people do live in the cloud. So we were able to le leverage that onto the edge. Uh, we were able to zero in on forehead. We were able to detect masks. Uh, we were able to detect symptoms. All of these, like AI models are not new. Um, and if we were able to teach other developers to do this, then they can do this as well. And so, you know, um, now we've had some developers come to us and say, well, you know, I don't really care about, uh, well, I mean, obviously they care about COVID, but, you know, the use case that I care about is being able to check people in, you know, um, I want to use facial recognition to see when people uh, come to work and then when people leave, because um, in other parts of the world, they'll sign people up and other people will show up to do the job. And so, um, you know, we, they, they said, can we use this developer stack to, you know, deploy these different models? It's just a matter of swapping out these pieces. Sure, why not? Um, you know, with in the last uh, two months, uh, fires have been a big issue here in California. So I thought, hey, we're just if we can deploy things at the edge, keeping these edge leg Lego brick building bricks the same, and just swapping out these different models, couldn't we just take an inputs to now detect fire, do video over uh, AI over video to detect when a fire breaks out, uh, to take inputs such as dryness, humidity, um, you know. Uh, and start to detect, hey, these are potential fire hotspots. Obviously, I care about this now since my kids haven't like breathed fresh air in the last couple of months. But you know, we want to be able to combine these building blocks such that everyone can do this, all developers can do this, and it's at the point at which we can do this at, that we'll see these real world applications really emerge and the rubber to hit the road. So to really summarize the, the point I'm really trying to make here is that we really want to unlock the power of cloud developers. Without the developers, the promise of the edge is going to suffer and we're going to be suffering this hype cycle of death. And I, I know, you know, we hear this a lot. I know we try to pretend that people aren't skeptical about the edge. They are. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's it's premature. I, you know, VCs have kind of written this off and said, hey, you know, I'm skeptical about the edge. I, I think they're going to be proven wrong at some point. 
once the developers come, the edge will come. And we saw this with big data too. I, I was an investor in big data and you know, we all rushed to big data and then all of a sudden, you know, things weren't materializing in it. And it took a number of years to the point where it, people were made it easy for developers to develop big data applications that, you know, big data took off and, you know, we're starting to see that, that uh, explode. Same thing will happen with edge. It's just a matter of getting the developers to there. In order to do so, we must make it as simple to develop for the edge as we do for the cloud. Again, by leveraging edge native techniques, um, we can enable developers to use the same tools, same techniques, and use the same developers, right? There's tons of cloud developers today, and they're the ones who are trying to get more and more data up into their um, cloud environments. So we want to leverage them. We want to be able to work as a community to detangle the confusion about edge development open source, not add to it. I know we want to promote our projects and we want to promote our foundations, but um, a better promotion would be figuring out how these pieces work together so people can actually use them. There's no better, um, you know, reward or there's no better um, accolade than seeing developers actually use the technologies that we built. And no one Lego brick can solve the problem. If I were to like give my kid one brick and said, here you go, here are your Legos, I think you'd be very disappointed with what I brought home. Uh, having these different Lego building blocks allows us to build different sorts of applications that allows us to solve unique problems and challenges. Some challenges are going to have broad appeal. Some challenges are going to be unique to certain organizations. We want to be able to give those Lego block bricks to people and allow them to create the, these applications. And we need to do all of this to drive long-term adoption of revenue and market growth for the edge. Ultimately, people are waiting for the edge market to appear, and it's the developers that are going to drive us there. So, you know, uh, I'm going to leave you with this final departing thought. The edge really depends on developers, and it's incumbent on us to help them get there. Um, and I, that's that's the goal for for what we're doing today at these foundations is, is what I hope for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Farah. This was. Amazing, and I, I like your two call to actions uh, and, and kind of uh, statements here. Obviously, developers are great. We are in a developer-centric conference here, so you know, perfect venue for this. Uh, I also agree that you know, Edge is a horizontal cons construct across the different markets, uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, telco, cloud, enterprise, IoT. And then I think the call to action on collaboration across uh, both foundations and projects is extremely critical, but even more critical to look at it from a lens of use cases and actual deployment scenarios. So really appreciate your, your thoughts here. Uh, let's move on to a, a, a key lightning uh, talk here or a keynote from one of the well-known entities of open source uh, software, right? Um, I think everybody knows Tom Nadeo from Red Hat. He's the technical director that there and he has been participating in pretty much everything open so let's hear on what he has to say about sort of the 2020 focus priorities and vision tom well good afternoon everybody uh welcome to ones 2020 um my name is Tom Nato. Um, I'm technical director at Red Hat, uh, and I wanted to welcome everybody to the conference. Uh, we've got some exciting things going on uh, for you all to to check out uh, over the next couple of days. Um, I've been a just a little background on me. Um, I run a couple of teams at Red Hat uh, around telco partner engineering, and uh, most interestingly for this conference, uh, networking uh, at at Red Hat and. Specifically, uh, we've been working um, on a variety of the projects here at uh, LF and LF Edge, LF Networking, um, and so I'm really excited about the various things that are that are going on at the conference uh, today. So, what I'd like to do is uh, highlight a couple of key areas that uh, that I've been thinking about, and and that perhaps you can um, uh, sort of think about as you go through the different sessions uh, over the next couple of days. Um, these are areas that have come out of um, myself and my teams working on um, very specific projects and um, for very various different customer deployments around these areas. Um, so things to just sort of look forward to uh, during the next couple of days. Um, 
So my 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 first area, uh, I think that of interest is um, uh, to look forward to, and there's a lot of really interesting things going on today in the evolution of Linux Linux kernel networking and Linux networking. Um, here in this area, you know, we've seen an evolution um, of Linux networking over the last couple of years, um, pertaining to uh, supporting uh, a, a variety of different technology technological changes, but specifically to support virtualization. So we've seen a lot of uh, hardware offload uh, types of um, types of, of additions. Um, and various other things to support virtual machines. And now most recently, we've seen a lot of work going on in, in container networking. And that's particularly where um, my teams have been spending a lot of time recently. Um, and there's uh, a variety of really interesting presentations uh, on the topics. Uh, for example, Maltus and uh, Service Mesh, um, which actually gets me into my next topic, which is uh, multi-cluster federation. Um, again, related to very closely to container networking, um, multi-cluster federation and multi-cluster connectivity uh, in general is a very interesting topic these days, um, specifically because um, generally speaking, uh, uh, folks don't use a single data center, a single geographic um, uh, uh, location for, uh, for compute uh, storage, et cetera. And being able to uh, federate and and mesh those things together in a in a way that uh, is appropriate for microservices um, is an ongoing challenge that um, you'll see a lot of presentations on, including one that I'm doing uh, with a colleague of mine. Um, further down the road, um, another area to focus on is uh, operations and specifically operators. Um, I, I think we've done a lot of good work at, at uh, the LF over the last few years uh, on projects like OPNFV um, and even ONAP that have tried to bring in the operator perspective um, in a in a perhaps a non um, developer targeted way, um, and that's been very good. But I think we need to do more work on this. And I, for example, um, am on a uh, moderating a panel. Um, during, during the conference uh, with a variety of network operators to really to get their perspective. And that really should be um, uh, something that'll be interesting for everybody to uh, take a look at. Because um, ultimately, the folks that have to use the uh, technologies we build uh, should have a really good say in, in how they're constructed. Um, another interesting area is the evolution of container networking. Again, I mentioned earlier uh, Maltus and, and Mesh. Um, there's a variety of other interesting things in this space, too, that you'll see uh, during the next few days. Uh, and that's a very interesting thing because container networking is pretty much the, the hot topic these days, uh, especially as it pertains to uh, some of the new 5G VRAN and Edge and MEC uh, types of use cases and deployments that we're going towards. Um, and then uh, creating solutions and fewer la Lego blocks is another uh, sort of area um, that I think we need to look at. Um, I'm on sitting on another panel this week um, uh, about the various edge projects in Li Linux Foundation Edge. And here, um, you know, while there's been a lot of really good work in, in this space, uh, one of the concerns is, is around having too many solutions, uh, if, if that's possible. And so look there uh, and, and hopefully participate to help us narrow that area down. Um, and then a, a couple of other uh, really important areas for me are um, better project governance, uh, really getting involved. Um, I mean, we do have certain projects where there is a lot of heavy developer in, um, involvement and in governance. Um, but in a few others, there's really there's a lot of uh, folks that are not um, as closely uh, involved in the in the day-to-day -day development as as we really could uh, have and that would really improve the project and then finally um, I really look forward to supporting developers um, even more so than we are today uh, Linux Foundation and its projects um, traditionally have been very developer oriented and supported and I hope we can continue uh, in that vein and you'll see um, a number of projects uh, uh, presentations this week from actual developers 
developing the various projects. And, and I encourage you to um, talk to them, meet to meet with them and uh, help help support them and um, maybe also jump into the projects yourselves. So with that in mind, uh, again, I welcome you all to uh, this year's ONES uh, 2020. And uh, I hope you all have a fantastic time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Uh, like your idea on, you know, call to participate specifically for developers and projects. So absolutely an important concept. Uh, I would like to add one thing on the kernel uh, networking side of things. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with a project called Dent, uh, that was launched earlier this year. It's a NAS, which really builds on the kernel native networking, right? So it's using switch dev and it's used for, you know, retail NASs and uh, data center type NAS. And this is really, think of it as requiring no abstractions. Like, you know, you keep on abstracting and then you lose uh, performance and increase cost. So this is like the, you know, native way of doing uh, NAS. So I, I just want to add one thing there, uh, but let's move on. Uh, the next uh, speaker is again, well-known uh, thought leader. Uh, from uh, Intel, Rajesh Gadiar. He's the VP of Data Platforms Group in CTO. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, let's have uh, Rajesh. He's going to talk about the edge as well. Hello, everyone. My name is Rajesh Gadiar, and I'm the Vice President and CTO for Intel's networking business. It's a real pleasure to be talking to you at this ONES event today. 2020 has been a very eventful year so far. I hope all of you are staying safe and doing well in the middle of this pandemic. Things seem to be improving recently, so I'm hopeful that we will return to normal operations soon, and I hope to see you all in person at the next ONES event. 2020 has also been the year of 5G. The foundation we have laid as a community over the last few years in virtualizing the network infrastructure and the 5G field trials we have led over the last couple of years have prepared us really well for the rollout of 5G services. Now, a key inflection point for us is the transition to cloud native approaches to build and deploy network applications. The disaggregation of hardware and software with NFT positions us really well for cloud native an approach that was pioneered by cloud service providers and now is being increasingly adopted in the network infrastructure. In the cloud native model, network and edge services are built as microservices to deliver better scalability, agility, and faster innovation. Today, I'm going to focus on the edge as a key business opportunity fueled by 5G. This picture here shows the key drivers of edge computing. The next generation of services, such as industrial and factory automation, particularly AI-driven automation, video and video analytics related services, uh, private wireless in the enterprises, all require low latency, determinism, end-to-end -end security, and quality of service. Now, this can only be achieved if the computing is done closer to the application of service. And this is exactly what an edge delivers. One way to think about it is bringing the cloud computing to where the application is and where the data resides. The virtualization of network infrastructure and the standard server-like infrastructure in the wireless radio access networks and telco central offices also open up the possibility to do edge computing at these locations. Now, some examples are content delivery networks or CDNs and cloud gaming, where you could host a GPU cloud closer to the consumers. Now, another option is to deploy edge microservices in telco regional clouds or even public clouds. Applications that are not highly latency sensitive can run in these clouds. In fact, the cloud native deployment architecture with microservices allows us the possibility to make use of any of these locations based on the application requirements, cost, and other considerations. Gartner predicts that by 2025, 75% of data will be generated outside the traditional data center or cloud. So the key takeaway therefore here uh, is that uh, edge computing is really as much about flexibility and scalability with which you can schedule workloads at various locations in the infrastructure based on cost, latency, quality of service, and a host of other requirements. Location is a consideration for sure, 
But in the longer run, flexibility and scale play a much bigger role in edge deployments. If you look at the challenges of deploying edge applications, first, the diverse nature of applications and services at the edge require heterogeneous computing resources, such as AI accelerators, GPUs, smart nets. Second, the edge needs to be dynamic and built with cloud native practices. Why? So we can respond to the dynamic nature of today's applications and services. Third, the edge needs to support key performance, latency, and quality of service, like I said before, and the needs of these uh, new age applications and services. Many of these applications that run at the edge are real time applications and have stringent requirements for latency and determinism. So now uh, let's look at what I believe are three key areas that I'm showing on this page that help us deliver the edge services with a cloud native approach. These are also the areas that Intel is putting a lot more emphasis on. First and foremost, the infrastructure or the hardware for the edge. Now we have driven significant innovations in our latest generation Intel Xeon platforms for both network and edge applications. Our vision quite simply is to make a standard server a best-in-class network applications platform and deliver a scalable, programmable, and intelligent infrastructure for edge services. In particular, for edge, we have developed a modular plug-and-play system architecture called Converged Edge Reference Architecture, or CERA. Second, the application platform, and how do we provide that easy button? So what Intel's doing here is we are focused on providing the software and tools that make it easy for application developers to build and deploy your applications with a cloud native approach. And to facilitate this, we have built an edge software stack called OpenNest, Open Network Edge Services Software, that provides a number of our platform optimizations in the form of microservices with REST APIs. Third, the orchestration and automation and the whole uh, CI, CD, the continuous integration, continuous deployment approach to create, deploy, and manage edge applications with scale. Now, in this area, we've been working extensively with Kubernetes and Kubernetes community and improving the networking and other capabilities in Kubernetes for edge applications. Now, one of our key efforts in Kubernetes is uh, what we call enhanced platform awareness or EPA. This allows us to expose key capabilities and new features in our hardware platforms including real-time telemetry data that can be used by Kubernetes controllers, such as placement controllers to place workloads with intelligence for best performance, performance for what uh, considerations. Next, uh, I want to zoom in and spend a couple of minutes on openness. I uh, made a reference to openness earlier, the open network edge services software toolkit created by Intel in collaboration with uh, many of our industry partners. Openness is a modular architecture and is intended to provide you a software platform with pre-built services to make your job easier as a developer of edge applications. So what does Openness give you? First, it abstracts network complexity, so you can choose across many different data planes, container network interfaces or CNIs and access technologies. Second, it provides a number of services for cloud native deployments. In particular, it has support for cloud native ingredients for resource orchestration, telemetry, and service mesh technologies. Openness has built in microservices for data plane processing, like I said, multi access networking, telemetry, various kinds of platform accelerators, especially for media and video processing, application security. And so, Openness provides many of these optimizations for hardware features for best performance and the return on investment. In, in many ways, uh, this is the easy button for building your edge applications. Now, if you're a developer looking to build edge services, I invite you to download openness at openness.org and play with it. As you begin to use openness, please reach out to us and provide your feedback. We would love to work with you and continue to enhance the capabilities in openness for your needs. We are ushering uh, in a new era of uh, distributed computing. We will see many innovations and new services in coming months, uh, especially as the 5G ramp happens. So I really look forward to working with the community to drive this uh, next phase of innovation. Stay safe and see you soon. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Rajesh. Uh, that was insightful and I agree, You know, 75% of the data created is gonna be outside the data centers, right? And 
Uh, you know, Farah said the same thing. Uh, you're saying it. I think a lot of analysts are saying Edge is kind of four times the market. So really excited about this whole uh, phenomenon, Edge. Uh, let's move gears into uh, something more deep, uh, more detailed uh, in terms of sort of the infrastructure side of things. And I want to introduce um, a, a couple of key speakers here. Uh, but before I do that, let me introduce, uh, you know, what they're going to talk about. I think I mentioned it at my keynote. It's a new project called Odin. And it's very exciting times. And, you know, we're going to spend a little bit more time on on sort of understanding what it's going to bring to uh, to the Linux Foundation and Linux Foundation networking from a telecom perspective. Uh, but the next keynote speakers are Jonas Arndt, who's the chief technologist, and Martin Halstead, who's the distinguished technologist at HPE. So without any delay, please welcome uh, Jonas and Martin. Hello there. So hi there, I'm uh, Martin Halstead. Um, and uh, as was uh, you know, previously discussed, I'm, I'm a distinguished technologist uh, within uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And my primary focus is on uh, technology within the, uh, the telco domain. Um, so I've been uh, alongside Jonas, I've uh, been working on uh, this Odom project and an associated HP product. Uh, that falls out of that uh, for well over a year now. Um, so in this presentation, um, we're going to talk about the um, the business problem in terms of what does Odom uh, address, um, what the project approach is with, um, in terms of the, the Odom community, um, the, the status of the Odom project, um, and then HP's product line, uh, the resource aggregator for Odom, um, you know what what that is and um, and how would we use it uh, in in terms of go to market. So um, when we talk about Odom, um, Odom stands for Open Distributed Infrastructure Management. And uh, what do we mean by Open Distributed Infrastructure Management? Um, we we feel that it addresses a number of issues that affect primarily um, telco-like use cases, but also equally could apply to uh, enterprises that have very distributed uh, data centers you know with infrastructure that are that are pretty uh, heterogeneous so um, so there are a number of um, telco infrastructure management challenges that we've looked to address with uh, with odom um, and and these consist of you know at least four different areas um, ranging from um, increasing numbers of distributed data centers. So, what do we mean by that? You know, as as um, network functions are virtualized uh, within telco environments, that's typically started from the core data centers of the operators. But as we're now moving, um, you know, and as is a primary uh, topic for this forum, outside of those core data centers, more to uh, you know to the edge of the the telecom operators' uh, networks in terms of metro, um, you know. Um, uh, central offices, radio access networks, etc. X eighty six based workloads have been placed out, you know, on um, uh, enterprise uh, IT infrastructure. You know, if effectively each of the points of presence for an operator uh, becomes a miniature data center, and each one of them are going to have their own sets of infrastructure, um, meaning that um, you know you exponentially scale out how you're going to try and manage all of those infrastructure points of presence. Um, so, so that's been a, you know, and it's become more and more a, a major head, headache for the operators. Um, in terms of that infrastructure, as, it deploy, as it's deployed uh, inside those data centers, you know, those points of presence, um, typically it's very heterogeneous. And what do we mean by that? Well, the infrastructure that you deploy in an edge deployment, um, particularly, you know, for, for areas like a central office or radio access network, um, it, it's fundamentally different typically from the infrastructure that you deploy inside a core data center, and that's based on a number of factors. Um, you know, principle one of those is cost, but also things like environmental constraints in terms of, um, you know, those points of presence further out in the edge could be fairly small, um, you know, narrow depth. Um, and then the component sets that would be deployed in that infrastructure would be um, typically heterogeneous as well. It would come from a number of vendors. 
Um, and when we talk about vendors as well, obviously, you know, we as HPE are, you know, pretty prevalent in those uh, environments in terms of IPT infrastructure, but also our competitors are there as well. So the environments are extremely heterogeneous. But from an operator perspective, they want to they want to manage the, you know, that compute, that storage, that Ethernet switch fabrics, uh, you know, using the same tool sets um, if they possibly can. But the thing that we find, though, is that if we look at those tool sets, there's typically minimal alignment across them. So the way that you would manage compute infrastructure um, is typically very different to how you would manage storage and networking. Um, and, and that's based on, um, you know, numbers of different uh, protocols that are involved, data models for managing that infrastructure, and then vendor specific implementations as well. So you have this, um, you know, uh, mix up of um, you know of different protocol sets, vendor implementations, data models, and that make it extremely different, difficult from an orchestration perspective, you know, service management um, to to manage that infrastructure. Um, so the the types of solutions then that exist um, to try and manage those infrastructures again, we find um, that those are typically closed, i.e., you know, single vendor solutions that may manage maybe, you know, one or two different vendors' um, uh, compute solutions, maybe one or two Ethernet switch fabrics, the same with um, storage nodes. But the, um, you know, the, the, the the management life cycle of those, um, you know, of those closed solutions, those, um, you know, those managed, uh, you know, per per vendor, um, you know, infrastructure management solutions, um, tends to be, uh, you know, entirely down to single vendors. Um, so, you know, you end up with brittle architectures that um, become extremely difficult um, to scale out and support, um, you know different vendors, different protocol sets, et cetera. And th this, this kind of leads to a, a lack of physical infrastructure management consistency um, that's, you know, particularly prevalent in the telco space. So, you know, as you can see in this diagram, you have a number of upstream COTS OSS service resources management stacks ranging from, you know, say OpenStack, Kubernetes, ONAP, et cetera, or even the operating systems themselves. You know, they would need to have bespoke integrations then to various physical infrastructure management solutions, typically coming from single vendors. And those in turn then would have, uh, you know, integration into the physical infrastructure itself, um, you know, based on protocol sets like Redfish, um, you know, GNMI, uh, NetConf, Yang, and, uh, you know, vendor, uh, vendor proprietary, um, you know, data models and, and protocol sets. So you have these, you know, a mesh of bespoke integrations. And so what we have uh, looked at from a, um, you know an, an open source and open perspective is how can we simplify infrastructure management uh, and truly make it open? So we didn't want as a vendor, um, you know, as HPE, to go and build our own infrastructure management stack. We wanted to work with the open source community, uh, which is why we approached the Linux Foundation uh, in, in terms of looking at tool sets that allow for you know, truly open infrastructure management. So, um, so in, in terms of our approach as a, a, a project for that, um, I'll now hand over to my colleague, uh, Jonas Arndt, uh, that'll take you through the Odom project. Yeah, hi guys. Uh, first, a little introduction on myself. I'm an, I'm an architect working for HPE in the telco segment, same team as Martin, doing very similar stuff. So Martin actually presented a bunch of problems and uh, we have been looking at those and, and you know, our interest is obviously to sell HPE gear and uh, HPE products. At the same time, we realized that if we could level the playing field and make sure that uh, things like operators could uh, use equipment from different vendors, <clears throat> it would be a good thing for all, for the whole industry. So we set up, set out a few objectives when we formed this project. Uh, uh, one of the objectives was obviously that we, we want to have like a, a standard aligned way of, of talking to, to the stack and, and we picked DMTF Redfish for that because Redfish has been around for quite some time. It's adopted in the industry and it has evolved and is dealing with a lot of the stuff that we, we have been looking at. 
So not only the API is on the top, but also the model is, should be pure redfish, and that's uh, one of the principles of the project. Other things that we wanted to do is that we, we want to make sure that uh, uh, Northbound clients didn't have to worry about vendor-specific implementations. So that's another key thing. And we also wanted to be able to just hit this stack and know about everything going on in the data center. So we wanted we wanted some sort of an aggregation, uh, and we very early started talking to the DMPF uh, uh, Redfish uh, standard body about introducing uh, extra things that will allow support for that. So you can hit the northbound interfaces and understand exactly what's in the in the data center, where it sits, in what rack, what aisle, and and what it is, and so on and so forth. So. Once we started looking at this a little bit more inside HPE, we started coding a little bit before it became open source, but we always did that with a with mind that we will actually uh, open source this and we would do it together with partners. So looking at the bigger picture here, on the top then you could have a bunch of different type of clients that will actually be able to communicate with the stack using standard Redfish uh, API calls and expect then that the Redfish model that is presented uh, is also aligned with the standard. On the southbound side, like Martin was pointing out, we have uh, a lot of different protocols. There are BMCs that speak uh, uh, IPMI, Redfish, different versions of Redfish depending on what vendor it comes from, perhaps different versions of Redfish even if there are two different uh, server models from the same vendor. So all of these things we wanted to, that has made it's very difficult to, to do standard uh, implementation automation. We wanted to sort of try to remove from the equation. So that's why you see on the southbound side that we have some, some different type of equipment and different type of protocols. So if we take that a step further then and look at uh, how the ODIM stack uh, looks like today, you can then see that on the northbound side, we have these type of uh, redfish APIs. There is also a box here saying integration, and that's if the northbound client do, does not speak Redfish, there is a, 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 obviously a need to do translations and things of that nature. On the southbound side, you can see that we have something called the ODIM resource abstraction layer, and this is what we refer to internally at HP as the plugin layer, and it will allow a vendor or uh, some contributor to develop a plugin that will uh, translate from their uh, server, switch, or what have you into this Redfish model. So for instance, if you're a vendor and you have a server that speaks Redfish, but perhaps it's an older version of Redfish, your, your plugin can then do translations from, from that older version to the newer version. Uh, all, all plugins will also actually have a, a leg on, a, on an event bus, being able to forward events up to the stack uh, because in the stack we have uh, the event service that northbound clients then could subscribe to. Looking at the stack here, you see there is a lot of different services, and they're all eight, uh, Redfish services. There is the account service, the event service, aggregation service is a, is a late contribution in the Redfish spec 2020.2. Uh, part of that is something we have worked on together with the partners in DMTF, uh, like uh, Intel and others. So. Um, Next slide, just then, how would, does this look in, in the ecosystem then? So obviously, in the project, we will, have, we will have hardware vendors, we will have operators and orchestration vendors and, and, and others, and we will all work together to, to, need, to weasel in the features we are looking for. And while doing that, we will also run into shortcomings of things like the spec. So we have obviously a relationship with Redfish and, and we try to influence them to, to implement things that uh, we feel we, the industry needs in the future. And, and sometimes that is uh, uh, easy to do, sometimes it, it takes a while, right? Also we have other projects that could consume ODEM like CNTT, ONAP and CNCF and others that will also have some requirements. So it's important for us to understand those and see if we can satisfy those while making changes to the stack, right? Um, then a little bit on where we are in the project. It's, it's a fairly new project. We've, it's formed in, in June, I think, and it's an unfunded project. What that means is that we're hanging straight off LF. We don't have an umbrella 
community that we are a part of uh, right now. That has some disadvantages and some advantages. So for instance, you don't have to pay any membership to, to join as long as you're part of Linux Foundation. Uh, at some point in the future, we will take a decision if we will fall into some uh, umbrella organization or, or what we will do, right? We have a PSC forum already, and we have meetings every Wednesday. It's 9 a.m. at Mountain Time, so anybody can dial in to just uh, participate. It's open for, for the public. Just looking a little bit at the contribution uh, that we did when we formed the project. So obviously, there were some seed code that went in. And uh, dark blue things here is representing what HP contributed. Uh, obviously, we, we set up some of the services here, as you can see, and the model, and, and we also contributed a plugin, a uh, generic Redfish plugin that anybody can use for Redfish equipment or as a template to develop uh, uh, your own plugin for, for your specific equipment. There's also pending contributions here. AMI is looking at do contributing composition, and we know Intel is working on a, on a plugin for unmanaged racks. Okay. Then um, what are we doing right now in the status? So the project is formed, TS, TSC is up and running, and we have, the com we have the contributed code like I mentioned. We're waiting for some other contributions as well. We have a website open that you can hit. It's odin.io. There, from there, you can get to the wiki, and you can see the meetings going on. And we have a mailing list as well. And GitHub, obviously. You can download the code. And anything HPE and others are doing now to enhance this further is all in the open. So when there are features created, you will see feature branches, and you will see uh, pull requests and all this type of stuff. So with that, I, I think I hand back to Martin to go over a little bit uh, the offerings that HPE has in this space. Martin? Right. Yeah, thanks, Jonas. So um, so the, just this next section will, will cover off then um, a, a product line that we have, um, which is basically our distribution of the, um, the Odom project uh, in, in terms of what we call HP's resource aggregator for Odom. So, so this is part of um, an overall HP telco value proposition. So we as HP, as, as you know, as I guess the majority um, uh, within the industry would appreciate, have been in the, the telecom space for an awful long time and have been in um, areas like uh, NFV, network function virtualization, since the beginning and, you know, in the formation of that. So, um, you know, as part of that, in terms of, um, you know, deploying industry standard, um, uh, you know, IT infrastructure in the telecoms environment, um, we, we do a whole a bunch of work in terms of things like telco compliance for OS and driver tuning. We produce blueprints of um, compute storage and, eth um, and Ethernet switch fabrics for, um, for various parts of a telecom operator's environment. We have um, infrastructure tools kits, um, you know, go to market propositions with something like HP GreenLake. But also, as part of that, then we will have a distribution, our own distribution of Odom. Um, and so that distribution of Odom would become essentially part of our telco blueprint evolution. So we have a number of uh, blueprints which are um, which are made up of HP infrastructure as. Um, you know, as, as example um, models of how you would build, um, you know, fully validated uh, NFVI stacks for a telecoms environment. Um, and as part of that, in terms of the automation of that infrastructure, we want to ensure that it's fully open. So, um, so those blueprints cover core and edge deployments. Um, and then in future um, core and edge models, each one of them would have an Odom um, resource aggregator um, deployed as part of that. So what we end up with then is a framework for um, HP's open core to edge uh, 5G infrastructure. Um, and that consists of, um, you know, obviously the infrastructure that we have as HPE, um, as well as the, um, you know, supporting management tool sets, which are completely industry standard and fully open. Um, and sitting above that, then, you know, we would um, form partnerships in terms of areas like composition management and monitoring. Uh, we have a couple on this slide there. 
uh, in terms of open source, as, as well as with um, companies like uh, AMI, American Megatrends. Uh, but then also layering on top of that, you know, various partnerships for virtual infrastructure management, SDN solutions, and then obviously the virtualized network functions themselves, which would come from the major network equipment providers, um, as well as the um, ISVs um, that exist within the telecoms environment. So, um, so hopefully that gives you a good overview of the Odin project um, and uh, HPE's offerings uh, in that space as well. Uh, so I'll hand back now to, uh, to the moderator. Thank you. All right, thank you. So we are in the final keynote and on a on a home stretch. Okay, sorry, stretch at home, everybody. I shouldn't have used that word, but that's what we are. Uh, so let's go ahead and I will uh, walk you through uh, my thoughts on where the next three years are going, okay? All righty, oops. <laughs> That is alrighty. Where's the slides? I'm sorry, I will. Uh, there you go. Again, we are in California. I don't see any earthquakes here, but uh, uh, let's see. That should come up. Well, at least we are showing that this is live, so that's good. Uh, let me start off by saying that um, in the in the next ten minutes, and I won't bore you to detail. Uh, what's happened is, uh, you know, we've seen a whole bunch of uh, good solutions, good open projects, and good ecosystems coming up. And I want to emphasize where we are going to head in the next you know three years so let me let me uh open it here locally and see where we should be going and i think the slides will come up you will always get a copy of these slides as we move forward um let's let's go ahead uh so the first thing i want to emphasize is uh that in terms of 2020 priorities we have three and here you go perfect thank you all right, so perfect, no time lost. The first one is there's a seamless telecom and cloud integration going on and it's at your fingertips, right? So we need to realize this and it's a very important thing. So let me show you how it's gonna happen with Google joining, with uh, uh, Microsoft, uh, you know, major participation in, in LF networking. How does this vision get realized? And if you look at the simple diagram I showed, it even becomes even more simpler. All right, uh, you know, with the ORAN, the Ukraine on the left hand side, but in the core, all of a sudden, you know, the carrier call, the public cloud, private cloud, all of that becomes a very simple stack. And that stack, if you start from the top, you have your applications, VNFs, CNFs, or any other cloud native applications, sort of standardized OSS, BSS, MANO type layer with analytics uh, coming to a controller uh, with uh, you know a VM, a VM based you know OpenStack running on Kubernetes, which becomes the infrastructure layer. Choose your uh, data plane acceleration of your choice, you know FIDO, DPDK, etc. There's a lot lot of options there and then you know integration with uh, public cloud players like uh, you know azure and and google uh, etc uh, and again this is not exclusive to these folks i'm just giving you one example here uh, there are plenty of public clouds you know including uh, vendors and uh, operators that have offered this so this is kind of a very simple uh, cloud plus telecom vision enabled by open source collaboration so if i kind of double click this a little bit um, the integration points become even more simpler, right? Uh, you have the northbound, which is all standard based. So this is the OSS BSSE services, right? MEF and TM Forum have done years of work there. And all those APIs have been coded up in ONAP already in the external API project. So keep that existing infrastructure and keep in mind, this is brownfield deployments. Uh, you know, I always joke, right? Uh, there's very few greenfield deployments 
And the moment you deploy your first green field, it becomes brownfield. So be aware of, of all the, uh, the hype around greenfield. But here's the reality, you know, 99% of the deployments will be, will be brownfield. On the left-hand side, in terms of, you know, designing the network, right? Standardized to Etsy and uh, Mac descriptors, right? Packaging, um, onboarding, uh, heat, Tosca, Yang, you know, templates, et cetera. And on the southbound side, obviously, you know, a huge, huge focus on Etsy, SOLS, GSMA, 3GPP, et cetera. Uh, and then those things running on Anthos, uh, if you take Google as an example, and, you know, the collaboration of that with under the Linux Foundation networking, end-to-end -end testing by, uh, you know, OPNFE and the CN CNTT merged entities. So clearly a great set of solutions now exist. And what we need to understand is how do these solutions kind of go and deploy themselves in more of a use case manner, right? You heard uh, our keynote speakers today and you saw them uh, talking about use cases. So let me talk about how some of the most important use cases that are driving open networking. So in networking, uh, you see the projects here. Uh, you can see ORAN, for example, the focus of ORAN, yes, while it's an alliance, the software portion called ORAN SC, as hosted by Linux Foundation, is focusing on use cases in 5G, end-to-end uh, -end network slicing, quality of experience optimization, white boxes, etc. If you look at the core and cloud, which is kind of the blue color here, uh, ONAP's use case focuses on slicing 5G, obviously, across cloud VPN, zero touch, closed loop automation, Volti, VIMS, VCP, etc., and nomadic broadband. Uh, we have talked a lot about the merge project, OPNFE, CNTT, all standardization, and then obviously Kubernetes as that underlying multi-cloud hybrid layer. So very exciting use cases that are uh, being deployed as part of these projects. And as far as said, right, like the Lego blocks are coming together in, in these use cases. If you look at the edge, the edge is even, you know, getting more harmonized and more unified, right? So you start off with that sort of the device edge, uh, things like anomaly detection, things like surveillance, things like on-prem uh, DevOps at scale, right? If you're talking the Project Eve, uh, or if you're talking uh, IIoT, things like predictive maintenance and condition-based monitoring for turbines, transformers, pumps, et cetera. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, integration with uh, AI ML, things like TensorFlow coming in, right? Uh, or maybe look at, IoT frameworks, right? Abstracting the IoT from uh, lifecycle management through microservices, things like building automation, industrial process control, smart cities, water, retail, etc. And then, of course, if you're talking the service provider edge, which is in purple here, you're talking blueprints and use cases like the radio edge cloud, the telco clouds, the connected vehicles, AR, VR, classrooms, uh, enterprise automation, even private LTE services, which are very, very critical this, this year and next, and then the public cloud edge interfaces. So lots of good, exciting, exciting use cases are being driven, and we want to make sure that the teams focus on and we accelerate the projects to production uh, cycle. And then the final thing that brings everything together is networking and edge are enabling a whole set of vertical industries, right? I, I opened ONES with this keynote uh, and this white paper that we have published, but this is not the uh, ending. This is the beginning. Telecom and automotive, they are working together to bring you the best of low latency connectivity with 5G, with autonomous driving and vehicle to X. Motion pictures with all these visual effects that come in, uh, which are software based, they are not only running through the network, but now they're running at the edge of the network with virtual shootings and virtual um, uh, effect processing, right? Uh, energy, uh, energy sector is really where telecom was five years ago. They are at the beginning of this open source revolution where the exact same orchestration, containerization uh, needs to happen um, at, at the grids, at the edges of the grids, at the core distribution sites, et cetera. And they are working on, you know, again, cybersecurity from an open source perspective. So very, very powerful energy uh, distribution. Financial, I don't need to even talk about that. I mean, we all know that networks are the underlying 
uh, it, it, it underlying frameworks for financial. And then of course, the latest is the public health and all the apps that are running through. So high level uh, story here is edge and networking are fundamental building blocks of vertical industries, and we need to just continue promoting them. So to wrap up today uh, and uh, you know the keynote sections, I have my observation. Obviously, I'm going to keep it to five. Uh, but the five observations that I'm sure you all agree with me uh, that you know listening to the keynotes in the session. Um, number one, network is even more important in the new world. You heard Andre. You heard Alex. You heard Justin. You know, it's not just the AT&Ts and the Equinix and the Deutsche Telekoms, but you've heard so many operators talk at the conference. Network is even more important in the new world. So please participate in, in this project because it's all being built on open source. Second, 5G, cloud, AI, edge, and IoT. They are key and they are technologies. But as I've always said, technologies come and go. If you remember in the last 30 years, we fought, we fought protocol wars, we fought technology wars, but that's no longer the case, right? You build, build these, build solutions, build things that are value. So these are key in building the next generation of solutions. What I'm most excited about is that markets are collaborating, right? Versus competing. You've heard it from so many of our uh, ecosystem players. Uh, this really, really, you know, brings out too many options, I would say, for the enterprises, right? Because now, if you look at end users, whether it's enterprises, governments, countries, they have a vast array of options using, quote, what I call the plumbing layer or the infrastructure layer, which is all open source space. And now, all of a sudden, they have the cloud-like connectivity, um, latency, and storage right at their fingertips. So very important for end users. And I think we've heard from so many of the vertical end users in the conference. And we'll hear more in the coming months as well. And not to say the least, collaboration is the way to go. Open source collaboration is the way to go. Uh, you know, we can't emphasize it. One company, one vendor, one operator, one system integrator cannot do it themselves. You know, in terms of dollars, in terms of time to market, as well as in terms to, of making it completely secure and making money. Right. And I'll get you, I'll leave you with a dirty secret, which we have seen participate. We lost your audio here, but that's fine. Uh, I think I was talking about a secret here. Uh, if you can hear me again, uh, what I was saying is, uh, all right, man, you, you muted me when I was like talking about a secret. So all the people who have stayed with me, uh, okay, I'm gonna repeat it. Uh, so the secret here is uh, that, that vendors, system integrators and members and um, you know, operators who have participated in the open source phenomena, they have received an unfair share of the deals uh, in 5G and beyond, okay? So keep, keep participating, keep uh, supporting. And with that, it's a wrap for me. A uh, couple of quick, two quick, two key updates. One is this afternoon, you know, at the sessions, uh, please uh, join them. But this afternoon around uh, three o'clock to four o'clock, Heather Kursky, our VP of Ecosystem, will be hosting a grab a beverage of your choice type thing, community happy hour. No judgment there. Um, and then there is a co-located event by LF Edge tomorrow. So do sign up because there is a limit. Our capacity has almost been reached. Uh, you know, while we, we in a virtual world, there is no room capacity. There is a limit to the number of bridges and things like that. So if you're not signed up, there's a LF Edge event tomorrow. 
But with that, uh, I'm going to sign off and wishing you all, you know, stay safe, um, enjoy the rest, and don't forget to fill out the survey. This is very important, right? We, this is our first virtual open networking and it's summit which is the, with a global audience from 75 countries. And we want to make sure that your experience is as pleasant because we're going to be here similar, you know, next, I don't know, three to six months at least. But let's, let's uh, stay safe. Thank you very much. Signing off now.